Hi, everybody, and welcome to Executive Insights. And we're going to talk a little bit about IT and OT convergence today. And I've got a couple of stars with me to have a great discussion. Jennifer, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then, Mike, you can uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. It's really nice to be here. Um, my name's Jen Jakes. I'm uh, the VP of um, our Global Supply Chain Digital Transformation. Um, so I work with the team really at the intersection of our uh, IT organization, our digital organization, and our supply chain organization. Well, we're going to learn how straightforward that is, I think, in this conversation. <laughs> so, and Mike, why don't you give, a, give everybody a sense of your position, please? Absolutely. So, Mike Anderson, I'm our CIO and digital leader for North America. So, I report both into our global CIO, Elizabeth Hackinson, uh, as well as Annette Clayton, our CEO of North America. So, I represent IT with our leadership team in North America and all of our agenda and things we want to do um, to help transform the business here. Yeah. So, like many people in big companies, you've got more than one boss. Is that what you're saying? Is that yes. Oh, so, and and, th and thousands of stakeholders with an opinion, I'm sure. So. Uh, so quickly, you know, we always like to start these conversations and just, uh, you know, talk a little bit about what we've been through with the pandemic. And maybe you guys can start with just what are some of the things, you know, what's kind of happened through the pandemic and, you know, how have we needed to adjust? Maybe we just talk a little bit about that. So, I don't know, you know, Jen, why don't you get us going? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think kind of like every other business, you know, we were really challenged to keep everything operational 24-7. We can't really compromise that uh, in our supply chain environment for sure. Um, we're servicing like all kinds of customers and uh, essential businesses, uh, as you know well. Um, so I think really what was critical for us in the supply chain was to um, leverage our existing digital transformation that we've been, you know, basically deploying for the last number of years um, to really ensure that business continuity across all of our plants and DCs, um, it, you know, and we were we were really leveraging our smart factory program and our our digital um, programs to be able to do that. Yeah, so some of the digital transformation we were already investing in was actually you know a good thing, right? Because uh, we were able to just accelerate some of our plans as opposed to starting from. Absolutely, from I mean it's probably like a shameless plug for our own uh, our own products, but we have a lot of our EcoStructure products deployed in our own plants. Um, it was really a, a good sort of acceleration and test of our resilience, uh, you know, using and leveraging those um, those platforms. We were able to really maintain our manufacturing operations, even though we had some factory based employees like, you know, planning, logistics, inventory, manufacturing engineers were able to work remotely using our uh, plant and machine yeah. infrastructure platform. So hold on, because I want to dive into that more deeply. So, but Mike, maybe this again, just as a high level, you know, what what was kind of the major adjustment as we went through the crisis? We're still in the middle of it, but it kind of feels like we're maybe we're starting to stabilize a little. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, the the main thing that everyone felt was how do we immediately go from you know VPN and remote working being you know the the edge or not the the, the major way people work to being the primary way people work, almost the exclusive way for all of our a lot of our knowledge workers. Uh, and so that obviously required a lot of focus on how do we, you know, scale up capacity on VPN? How do we make sure that all of our systems work well for people on from home? From home? Uh, you know, like most large companies, we have, you know, systems of all ages. You know, we call some of those antiques um, that people have to access. And, you know, making those are not always built for work from home. Uh, and so making sure those were resilient, we had more than one way for people to access them. You know, that was a lot of what we had to focus on with the pandemic. Uh, and then also just, you know, thinking about business continuity is not just systems, but also people. You know, if someone gets sick um, from COVID, you know, how do we respond to that? Who backs them up? Um, and so there was a lot more that went into business continuity and disaster recovery than just the systems. Yeah. So continuity, resiliency is about the people and making sure that you can compensate as well. So that's good. So, you know, you guys are sitting in between IT and supply chain. It sounds like a very fun place to be. Uh, you know, and we talked with Elizabeth Hackinson about, you know, working from home and the challenges with that. I wanted to dive a little bit more deeply into the specifics between IT and supply chain. And, um, you know, you, you kind of hit on remote as being a, a key aspect of what we are doing. I mean, Jen, can you dive into that now, maybe a little bit more about, you know, what do, what do we have to do for customers who couldn't come on site? Were, were there other things that we did uh, for the factories? Yeah, absolutely. So probably the most prominent example I can I can 
um, call out is our factory acceptance test. So this is really a process where customers come on site in our factories. They're evaluating the equipment during and after the assembly process. And usually customers would come to a Schneider plant, conduct the tests, verify that the product you know, meets their requirements before we move into mass production. And so we really had to work quickly to implement a process you know, that where we could do that remotely. So we, we were using cameras within the plants, we connected to our secure network, and it really, it allowed our partners and customers to leverage that video feed, um, you know, with Skype and, you know, be able to witness the test in real time. And then we've been able to kind of scale that methodology across 80 of our facilities. I think since the pandemic began, we've done over a hundred remote tests. So, you know, it allowed us to continue that supply chain process uninterrupted and, and keep, you know, the manufacturing and, and supply um, delivery on time. Yeah, so really it's an example where digital enabled us to still be productive right even though we were in the middle and people couldn't come on site right and i imagine it's likely people this might become the new new normal as everyone likes to say that maybe i don't need to go on site to do a factory acceptance test uh, yeah i think yeah. so i think covid was kind of a catalyst for that uh that shift absolutely yeah. i'm sure you know people outside of schneider and you talk into the the greater industry as well i mean are we the only ones doing this or in your these the community do you see other people moving more towards this remote management yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's definitely a trend. I mean, everyone's been forced into it, right? I mean, we've seen it across a lot of industries. You know, always a believer that, you know, the consumer technologies and what we do with things like in our schools, for example, and how quickly we pivoted, um, you know, quickly translate into what we do at work as well. And so we're definitely seeing that. Um, people are, you know, I've seen just like the factory acceptance test, we've seen other people finding new ways to do things with digital tools, whether it be Teams or Zoom or whatever the, the, the tools are. Um, so definitely it's a trend that I see amongst my peer group of, you know, we have to be able to do everything remotely because we don't know that we're going to be able to send someone on site tomorrow. Right. So it's great. So, you know, I kind of want to shift gears now, right, because we just talked about the pandemic and we've talked quite a bit of, uh, in other sessions about how the you know digital transformation getting accelerating. I want to take a step back a little bit, though, and talk more about, you know, this term industry 4.0 and IT and OT convergence. You know, maybe you can kind of share your perspectives on it. Mike, why don't we start with you this time? What's kind of your perspective on IT, OT convergence? Is this just a hype myth coming from uh, the IT industry or is there something actually happening? No, there, there's definitely something happening there. You know, it's a, you know, you know, really, if you go back and rewind the clock, it all started when IEP addresses started getting assigned to equipment in a plant. You know, that be started to become, you know, an IT area, especially with cybersecurity. Um, and as we've started to apply more of the enterprise IT tools, um, things like you know data collection and um, artificial intelligence, a lot of these new tools that are coming, you know that's forcing more and more convergence in that area because you you need you know more compute more than you would have just running a manufacturing line. You need more compute on the factory floor to drive you know more of those discrete optimizations you want to do. Coming back to Jen though on IT OT convergence, you've got an interesting title, right? So what? What, can you give me a history of this organization and uh, what, why it evolved? Yeah, I mean, I think my team is um, exactly a, like an example of how organization structure is having to change, you know, amid this ITOT convergence. Like my, my team today used to be two teams. There was one team in our digital organization and, uh, and a sort of complementary team in our global supply chain organization. And about a year ago, we really, we converged the teams, um, uh, you know, under one uh, leader, just to really kind of harmonize those discussions, start the collaboration at, at a different level. Um, but it's a challenge, right? Because the organizational structure, uh, you know, hasn't necessarily caught up to that way of orienting teams, you know, cross-functionally. So, um, you know, I'm living in that environment, as you said at the beginning, you know, you've got two bosses. Uh, I've also got teams that work in both organizations. Um, so it's complex, but the benefits, you know, far outweigh the complexity. Um, you know, having those teams working together, collaborating together on cross-functional teams, uh, you know, projects, um, it, it just makes all the difference. Yeah, so it's uh, not only is there a technical convergence happening because of uh, 
manufacturing products coming or manufacturing machines coming onto the IP network like Mike and that started you know years ago right so IT to OT convergence isn't necessarily new but it, it's actually evolved now to where it's also the people in the organization that's changing and uh, having to come together so so you know I I would imagine then you know and I always tell this joke if if my uh, you know if my internet goes down at home I used to think of it as a small vacation because of from from uh, uh, being able to, uh, from work, but, you know, one of the things that we've talked about in other sessions is that the importance of IT now, and now it's actually becoming much more business critical. Now, when you're talking about manufacturing, that's a lot more important than, you know, me having my laptop up and running, I would assume, so Mike, but, you know, so how's that really, you know, what are the, what are the new requirements that are coming into you because of this convergence that's happening? You know, well, there's two, there's two things there. You know, the first one is, you know, as we've moved more and more of, you know, our applications, some of the servers have moved into into cloud. Um, you know, that's driven, you know, uh, important the importance of network resiliency. You know, I need to make sure that I've got, you know, diversity in how I connect to a plant, how I connect to my network, my data centers. Um, that's also means you have to have power to power that equipment. So I need to make sure the power is resilient. So you have to check all the boxes on that side. And then it extends out to the factory floor. You know, you used to have Wi-Fi in plants. It was, you know, typically in the, the work areas where you had people sitting at a desk. Um, now, you know, instead of having cables all around my floor, I've now got Wi-Fi access points everywhere. And if that Wi-Fi goes down, my scan guns don't work anymore. My conveyor lines don't work anymore. Everything just comes to a complete stop, you know, if the Wi-Fi and the internet goes down. And so those points, those areas have become such critical, uh, you know, critical facets of how I run my business. You know, that is, you know, really a, an, an area that, you know, we continue to see a lot of pressure on every day. So, Mike, it, it's, uh, I'm interested, you know, you're kind of hitting on like the importance of uh, continuity and the Wi-Fi and the resiliency of that, you know, um, but, you know, what other things are hitting, particularly, I mean, cybersecurity is always a big topic. And so if the OT systems are coming on the IT network, you know, give us some more insight into what you're seeing there. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, there's a couple of facets there. You know, first off, um, you know, you know, we have different types of devices connecting. So it's not just the OT, the, the system that's coming on that's been purpose built by the manufacturer for a line um, and protecting that. But, you know, we have more um, devices, everything from smart devices, wearables, computers now that are in, in the plans that we have to make sure are secure. Um, and where it becomes really important, especially with our business is, you know, we're building critical infrastructure that many times has embedded operating systems in the hardware. And so if we have a, a system on the line that gets a you know, ransomware or virus on it that now can get passed on to a customer's equipment, that creates a, a really bad, um, a bad place for us to be as a manufacturer. Um, and so that's, that's definitely one of them. And then what we're also seeing is we have to look at our policy. Um, if you think about like data, for example, different types of data require different levels of security. We have to think about a policy-based approach with, you know, manufacturing lines. You know, how I manage a laptop and how I manage a PLC, how I manage, you know, different types of devices with my plant require different types of policies. And that's an area that, you know, we're evolving in and a lot of companies are also evolving in as we have this convergence happening. Yeah, because the threat on like an embedded system is much different than, say, a laptop operating system and how we, how we deal with that has to be different. Is that, am I understanding you correctly? Is that... Yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of times you don't know that you've, you know, if you have an infected machine, you may not know it um, if you don't have the right protections in place. And then you may, without even knowing, pass it into equipment that's now going to get embedded into a customer's environment. Um, and that's never a place we want to be. And so that's why we have to make sure that, you know, that every every touch point on those lines has the right level of security posture to make sure um, that we're protecting ourselves and our customers. So Jen, I think you were trying to jump in there. So sorry I interrupted you. Reinforce that, you know, like cybersecurity has really become an, you know, embedded priority in our overall, um, you know, digital supply chain uh, strategy. Um, you know, it's just a, it's just an absolute necessity and, and is taking top priority for sure. Yeah, and so it's really the IT department, right? The IT group is taking responsibility for the cybersecurity, which was introduced because things started coming onto the IP network. Is that? Yeah, and again, going back to organizational evolution, you know, like we've embedded an IT lead um, within the global supply chain organization, um, you know, to lead that program and, and that deployment. All right, so maybe shifting gears for a second, you know, there's a there's a topic that we I, I can't have any conversation, which is talking about analytics and automation and data, 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I know for most people, get, getting all of the data is very simple and it's really just about doing the analytics. So is that, is that assumption correct, Jen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this is a big part of my world these days, Kevin, um, you know, is really, uh, you know, understanding all of our legacy data platforms, how they're interacting together, um, you know, as everyone wants more and more analytics, we want to kind of develop, um, um, you know, more automation and analytics can permeate it through the organization. Uh, we also have to consider the foundation of the data architecture. Um, and yeah, it's a big, uh, a big task, even for a company like Schneider, for sure. Yeah, and I, I read somewhere, Mike, I don't know if you've seen this, but something like uh, 80 or 90% of a data scientist's time is actually spent normalizing data, right? So my question is, why can't you just get all these systems working together? Oh, absolutely. You know, that would be great if we bought all of them yesterday. Um, that would work well. But yeah, I mean, data preparation is the is the heavy lift within within data. You know, that's what's always great is you have a vendor come in and they do a demo with their analytic platform and it looks all great. And what you don't realize is that someone did all this amazing data preparation and normalization before they did the demo. And, you know, it, that's the heavy lift in the series. So that's obviously an area, especially when you have, as I referred to earlier, antiques in your environment um, that maybe have data that comes in different formats that you don't have people in your workforce that normally, you know, would understand anymore. And so you have to figure out, you know, how do I get data from those as well? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I, I use an analogy, I probably overuse it on my team and with my peers, but, you know, it's kind of like we have to change the tires on a car that's still got to move 100 miles an hour, you know? I mean, we we still have to deliver those analytic solutions, those automation solutions in our current environment while we work on stabilizing the foundation. So, um, you know, that's really the balance that I think we're having to strike. Um, and, and sort of moving along on that journey. Yeah, it is, uh, it is kind of a monumental task that at times can be difficult to explain to management, but I'll let you guys deal with that. No, the, the chief data officer could be a good candidate for your next uh, executive insights. Well, we might have to look at that. So, so getting out of the, the, the mundane of the reality of today, right? I thought maybe we'd shift gears a little bit and talk about um, you know, where, where might the future be going and, and uh, where, where do you see, Mike, you kind of hit on this early on in our discussion about uh, uh, could, will there be more compute at the edge, a big topic in the industry. And, uh, you know, I've had people come back to me and say, no, it's really a myth because everything's going to go into the cloud. Um, what are you kind of seeing? Is, is, is there applications today that are driving the need for more compute at the edge? Is there applications coming that you see? You know, what, what are the things that you're, you're, you're looking into? Yeah, you know, I think it's a, you know, I give an analogy um, of a car, right? We all talk about autonomous driving cars, but do we really want our car dependent on the cloud? You know, what happens if that connection just goes away all of a sudden as my car stop driving, my autonomous car? And so as we think about that, that evolution, we think about that inside of our, our plants. Um, you know, there's some of those things where you have to, to slice the data uh, in a way where you have the right data that's available with the right compute at the moment you need to make that split second decision. So example, having machine learning or AI in a manufacturing line, looking at a, a product, whether it be a consumer product, in our case, a board to look for quality or defects. You, that's a, an instant decision you have to make. You don't have you know, the time or the ability to wait for latency of something going to the cloud, coming back to make that decision. And so we really, it forces us to have you know, the, the slice of data we need to make that decision, and then we're backing things up to the cloud. So from a resiliency standpoint or from a management standpoint, I have the ability to make changes um, which don't require that split second decision making. Yeah, so when, whenever we do these series, uh, or whenever we're talking about uh, new, new trends in IT, it's inevitable that you have to talk about 5G. You, know, you can't uh, go to any conference without this topic coming up. I'm just curious, Mike, what about, uh, you know, wh where are we seeing 5G? What's your what's your take on it, and uh, how do you see it might it might help us as a technology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so definitely 5G is going to have an impact. You know, beyond what we see in the consumer side, where we talk about 5G networks for you know the next fast speed past uh, you know past 4G and LTE, right? So we see all those areas solving the last mile problem. Where we're seeing it in a lot of enterprises today is private 5G deployments, and why that's important is because. You know, we talked about Wi-Fi before. When I want ubiquitous, ubiquitous Wi-Fi within a facility, I've got to deploy a lot of access points to get the coverage I need. 
And as we look at 5G, I now have the ability to put up a tower and get that same coverage with a lot less infrastructure. Now, I need to make sure I have resiliency of that tower and I need to make sure I have power behind it and all the things I would expect for remote monitoring, you know, some, some great tools that we provide. Um, but, you know, that's going to allow us to, you know, really evolve. And, you know, what's going to be interesting is also all those connected devices that are used to a Wi-Fi connection are now having to be tuned for a 5G connection. You know, and so that's something else that we're going to see, you know, evolving is that tuning um, going on as we as we move forward as well. Okay, so this is really, you know, classic IT guys. I could see Mike's enthusiasm coming. It's 5G, it's new technology, it's cool. So Jen, you have to go work with the factory floor and try and get all this stuff implemented. I'm sure they are willing to embrace it with uh, just on Mike's word. Is that is, is that correct? Well, I mean, I would say like we're pretty far along the deployment of our smart factory program and we're starting to see that shift, I think, with our with our workforce and, you know, really finding those digital natives in the factories. Um, but I mean, I, I'm a perfect example of this. Honestly, Kevin, I, I worked in Schneider for 14 years in the supply chain organization. And really, it's been less than a year that I've been part of this intersection with IT. Um, you know, it's fascinating. It's a steep learning curve, um, but you, you know, you really start to see what's possible uh, when you get up to speed on these, you know, emerging um, digital technologies. And I, I think part of the evolution that we're on and part of the role of my team is acting a bit like translator between the IT organization and the supply chain organization, um, you know, this is where I think teams like mine that are at that intersection point uh, are able to really bridge the gap. So Jen, I think you mentioned Smart Factory, or certainly I've heard a lot about the Smart Factory program we have going on within Schneider. I mean, can you just tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think what what I would say is the the digital evolution of the supply chain is much broader than only the smart factory program. Um, you know, we've been really focused on that in our discussions today in terms of IT, OT convergence on the factory floor. Um, but our digital supply chain transformation is in fact, you know, a much broader scope, uh, you know, that ties into our tailored, sustainable, connected 4.0 supply chain strategy. And you know, this is really about an end-to-end -end transformation um, of our overall, um, you know, supply chain from planning through manufacturing, through delivery uh, to our customers, you know, having an end-to-end -end, end -end visibility across the supply chain. I, there are so many programs going on. It's what really makes me excited about this particular job. I mean, as I said, I've, I've been in this, in this, you know, space for less than a year. I can't believe the evolutions that are, are happening at Schneider uh, around digital and the supply chain. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying is IT, OT convergence. I mean, when I get in these conversations, people tend to think about the factory floor, but what you're saying is actually it's much greater than that because it's the entire digital transformation of the organization, our planning processes, and really how we operate as a supply chain. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, and I mean, I think it's just, that's just being demonstrated uh, even more so in this COVID era, you know, it's really been foundational to our resiliency uh, as, as a supply chain. Well, that's great. Well, thanks so much for your time here, guys. I think we, we've covered the topic pretty well. I'll just, uh, maybe I'll try and summarize it and see if you guys can agree with me. So first of all, you know, remote everything is probably here to stay coming out of this COVID crisis. Is that a fair statement, you think? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, secondly, the IT is becoming business, or if it wasn't, it certainly is now business critical, right? Because the, if the Wi-Fi goes down, the plant goes down. I'll, I'll quote you on that, Mike, from now on. Right? <laughs> and uh, embracing technology as much as a cultural and organizational challenge as it is a technology challenge. And that's kind of what I pulled out of a lot of comments Jen made. Is that? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And then finally, it sounds like IT and OT convergence is not a myth and that uh, edge computing is real and it's happening today in the factories. And it's really an extension of what's been happening for the last, say, 10, 20 years. You guys agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Good. So I, I think it's the first time I've gotten a supply chain oriented person, an IT person, and a, what I consider a product guy actually all agreeing on something. So thanks very much for your time, guys. And we really appreciate it.
Uh, it was terrific. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you.